through the years, I've gone back and forth and back and forth. But then I came to the conclusion that I cannot leave my journals because of the confidences that people have, have um, placed in me and also because I am so clear that I've written these journals for myself. And in fact, I have made a pact with myself that at any time I hesitate to put something down on paper for fear that someone will read it is when I either will stop journaling or force myself to write it because I know these journals have been written for me. Later. This is the journal that I started um, when I turned 40. I, in, in this color, I said, I'm turning 40. So it was the day before I turned 40, but I was writing. I was spending a lot of time writing about what, um, what it was going to mean to turn 40. And you can see that in some of these journals, I have different colors of ink. I got, I th I got onto a peacock blue. So a lot of my journals um, are in peacock blue. Oh, yeah. You'll like this one. Someday I, I want to see it all. In my next 40 years, I want to see the tulips bloom in Holland. I want to ride in a gondola in Venice. I, I want to do and see so much more that I've never seen before. I have so much to live for, so much to look forward to. Okay. How many journals are in the, in the safe? 350. Yeah. And what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to them? Um, I don't know. I don't know yet. I haven't completely decided. I am working on a project where I'm taking excerpts from them. Um, I, I think that there will be some that I will give to people. The collection as a whole, I really don't know. In my um, will, it's clearly stated that my journals are to be destroyed. That's not what I really want. What I really want is for me to have a great-grandchild who speaks to my soul in some way, who I could leave my journals to, to not be opened um, until 50 years after my death, so that my children and my grandchildren will not, not read them. Because I think that, I, I feel really strongly that if someone reads something and you're not alive to justify it or talk about it or explain it, it can be really detrimental. And so I think great grand, a great-grandchild is my only hope for that. Um, and I don't know if that's ever going to happen, not to mention that it would be really costly and how would I store them and what would I do with them. So that's an issue. Imagine having 40 years of your life documented. So it's not just what I did every day, but it's what I thought, how I felt. And when I go back and read it, it's bringing back all of those memories in a very powerful way because, because I just didn't document the experience, but I documented what the experience meant to me or how, it, how I was feeling in the moment that I was writing. And so... You know, I'm living my life, but I'm also going back to this other time in my life when I'm bringing it back up. So, so it's, it's very powerful to go back and read something that I wrote 40 years ago and be in that moment, and that's really what's happening. And it's also so intense. I can just, I can just look at words on the pages and know exactly what state of mind I was in when I was writing these journals. And this one, it look, appears as though I was um, going through some real soul searching. So it's pretty interesting to see. August 18th, 2012, 5.15 in the morning. 
I asked Eileen for a word to help me find to describe the timing of my mother's death from my book in the author's notes. This is what she wrote. It seems to me, Merle, that your mother's death was not memorable. It was her life that was remarkable. Her death was anticipated, expected, and natural. However, the timing of her death was significant, spiritual, and phenomenal. Her death gave rise to the deepest of thoughts and profoundest of questions. What matters most in life? You summarized her values in your eulogy, knowledge, learning, teaching, sharing that which she knew with those who are in her inner as well as outer circles. Inherently, she was a dedicated teacher who believed in sharing the gift of knowledge with others. You, like her, have the passion and the purpose to teach. To close the doors on your life at the center was to be able to open gates to a new world of writing and teaching. Your mother knew of your mission, perhaps an extension of continuation of her values. Perhaps when she chose the time of her dying, her message to you was, you were prepared, ready, and able to carry on the banner of educating and enriching others. And with you by her side, she unchained herself from her physical existence. I think, I think my journals um, give me the opportunity to really delve deeply into my life and maybe thinking about them, thinking about my life and doing that would be more fleeting. But by writing it down, by committing it to paper, I think that it's more permanent. And it, um, you know, we can think about something and maybe perseverate over it because it's just an obsession or we're trying to deal with it. If you talk to someone, it changes the conversation. If you write about it, it also changes the conversation. So, for example, when I go walking in the morning, I might think about a lot of things that kind of float in and out, or, you know, like a meditation where you think about it and it's gone. But because I've thought about it and then committed it to paper, it gives a permanence to my life that I might not have had in the same way. In this journal, I turned 30, and I have not looked at this actually um, for many, many years, but I'm going to read what I wrote on my 30th birthday. We'll see what comes up. So this is December 12, 1974, Reflections on My 30th Birthday. When I think about having lived 30 years, it almost seems impossible. Yet my life has been full and happy, and I only look forward to many good years ahead. I now feel that I will be able to spend my days and time in general in the be way best for me. Since I've alleviated myself of so many unimportant problems, garbage as they say in TA, I feel so much better. I can now breathe deeply and I'm beginning to know where my head is at, as well as being totally on my way to, to self-awareness. I seem to be more aware of my true and honest feelings, and it's a nice way to be. So many special things have happened to me up until now. Probably the best is that I have Daryl, and I'm finally allowing myself, allowing us to be our own persons, and yet one in many ways. He's such a good husband and father. I'm quite fortunate. We've had some super moments together. As I just thought back on many, it has certainly been a good marriage. Having known him for so long, and from so many years ago has been a nice thing. We have grown up together. In many ways, Rebecca and Michael have helped to make me feel more complete. They really have a great ability to carry on our love, happiness, and caring, which Daryl and I have given to them. Although there are moments when I feel a great need to be freed of them hanging on me, I try to accept that and realize that for me it's normal. I really love them and feel fortunate to be so lucky to have them. And then I just go on and on and on and on. There are not enough hours in the day. I've been engrossed to my journal project and seem to want more time to work on it. My real dream is someday, when I finish all of this, to go back and read my journals, just sit down and read my journals from the beginning to the end. Not this, because this is crazy. To just start at the beginning and read them I mean, it would be a wonderful way to do a life review. So I'm hoping to live a long life and to still have my mind to be able to do that. But I think I will.
be remembered as someone who lived a meaningful life, who cared about other people, who left this world a little better place for having been here. And who wrote a lot of journals. A lot of journals. Listen to the wind, a whisper.